All right. So, um, unless there are questions about, I mean, there's an assignment due next week. Are there any questions about that? Okay, so I'll just start talking about Popper. Um, Karl Popper was, uh, he was a German philosopher um, who uh, was an associate of the Vienna Circle in certain ways. Um, he wasn't actually in Vienna, he was in Berlin. Um, but he agreed with them about a lot of things. Um, he also disagreed with them about a lot of things, as you could tell if you did the reading for today. Um, and as, there was always a certain amount of discomfort and even hostility in both directions, All, um, especially between Popper and Neurath. So um, we'll, when we read uh, Neurath's paper criticizing Popper, we'll see how just how hostile he was. Um, um, in some sense, he's more of a philosopher of science than the other people we've read so far. Um, you know, I mean, like the main point of this book, which is his most important book, is to explain what empirical science is. Um, um, but, uh, you know, <clears throat> he certainly felt free to write about anything and everything. He wasn't a specialist, as we now understand it. He wrote uh, several books about politics in political philosophy. He um, was interested in the history of philosophy. He wrote, published a book about Parmenides. Um, What else should I say about him? Um, I think it's fair to say that among philosophers, he's been much less influential than Carnap or Quine. Um, um, I mean, certainly not without influence. Uh, and certainly, I think even to this day, there's a, a little bit of a school of Popperians um, who see themselves as, you know, carrying on his tradition. Um, but the mainstream of English speaking or analytic philosophy followed more from Carnap than from him. Um, on the other hand, among scientists, Popper, I think, is uh, uh, much, much better known first of all, than Carnap or, the, or, or Quine or other uh, people that we've read so far. Um, and for the most part, kind of, um, at least I think this is still true, that um, especially in the physical sciences, a lot of people um, like Popper and at least think they agree with Popper and they'll quote you know, they'll, they'll, they'll mention Popper's criterion of falsifiability when they're trying to explain what makes a theory scientifically legitimate or something. Um, although, generally speaking, they tend to not pay attention to the part where Popper says that empirical observations don't provide any justification for theories. Right? He says they don't even make them more probable. So, you know, most of the time when you mention that to the scientists who think of themselves as following Popper, there's like, oh, well, no, that's not true. Obviously, our observations make it more likely that our theories, is tr our theories are true, but, um, but uh, Popper didn't think that, as we can see, as, as we'll see, as we've already seen, I guess. Um, I think he's also much better known outside academic philosophy than Carnap um, or Quine. Uh, 
you know, when I used to, this isn't really true anymore, but I used to say that, you know, when people asked me what I was working on, I would say, well, one thing I'm working on is Carnap, and they would be like, Karnak the Magnificent? <laughs> that's, pro that's probably a dated reference, too. But anyway, um, so uh, um, whereas Popper, I think, you know, has more uh, popular traction, at least, you know, among people who are interested in public intellectuals, uh, not necessarily, a lot of that is not necessarily liking him, though. Um, Partly because of his political writings, he's kind of um, not highly thought of in some circles. And he definitely was to the right of Carnap and Neurath. Um, um, although not that much to the right. I mean, he also had to leave Europe when the Nazis came to power, and he never went back to Germany. Um, um, but uh, he was not a socialist and certainly not a Marxist, and he was a, a fairly harsh critic of 20th century Marxism, as opposed to original Marx. So, I mean, uh, I'll maybe a little, say a little bit more about why today, although that's not the main focus, you know, we're not reading that part of his work. So, um, he was a liberal Democrat, not in the sense that we mean liberal in the U.S. or Democrat with a capital D in the U.S., but he was a liberal Democrat in the way, you know, like the party in the United Kingdom that's called liberal Democrats, meaning, you know, he was uh, a Democrat in the sense that he thought democracy was a good idea. Um, it is a liberal Democrat, meaning he thought that, uh, you know, um, government power in a democracy should be limited in various ways and especially, you know, like shouldn't try to plan and uh, plan the economy. Um, okay, so that's a general introduction to who Popper is. Um, this book, as I said, um, is, although it's his earliest book, is, is nevertheless probably his most important. It was first published in 1935 in German. Um, the title in German is Logik der Forschung, which I'll say a little bit later about what that means, but it was translated into English. Now, so in a sense, we're lucky to have this book in English, by which I mean that it wasn't translated, it wasn't published in English until 1959. So between 1935 and 1959, Popper was a well-known figure in English-speaking philosophy, but his main work wasn't available in English. Um, and that might be part of the explanation for something that Popper sometimes complains about, uh, namely, that a kind of mythical version of Popper's view was substituted for what he actually said. Um, but um, we're especially, at least if you have the edition that I ordered, here's what my copy looks like anyway, um, that you're, we're lucky to have this later edition where Popper added a lot of footnotes and also some appendices and stuff. Um, um, if you want to know what's going on with that, you should read the translator's note, which is pages Roman numeral 12 to 13. It's just very short. That explains what those asterisks in the footnote mean and whatever. But basically, those notes that have a little asterisk next to them are notes that weren't in the original edition, but that Popper added later. So a lot of those, you know, um, well... I guess I put it this way, those two things together, having his original book and with his own later clarifications can help us avoid certain misunderstandings from the beginning. So it's a good thing. Although it also could be a little bit dangerous because of course, um, in the translation, which he oversaw himself, right? There isn't a separate credit for a translator. Although what it says in the translation note is um, 
The translation was prepared by the author with the assistance of Dr. Julius Fried and Lan Fried. So I don't even know exactly who those people are, but in any case, uh, I guess it stands to reason that they did a lot of the actual translation work and, and Popper just supervised them. But so anyway, so he's behind the translation and obviously behind these later notes, and he's not necessarily, philosophers can't necessarily be trusted to tell you what they were thinking 20 or 30 years ago. They're always trying to, you know, Interpret it in a way that makes it sound good for by their present opinions <laughs> Not necessarily in an actively deceptive way although that happens too but more in the terms of like when you think back to What you said a long time ago, you'll say well, yeah, I think what he really what I really meant was right so like if we were really trying to do history of German philosophy in the 30s in this course these later things could be a little bit dangerous. I think for our purposes. They're mostly helpful Okay, so that's a general introduction. Are there any questions about that before I start talking about the content of the reading? I notice I left the light on that's causing glare on the board let me just go really quickly and turn that off. Okay, that's better. Um, so the main questions of the book are asked in the first few sentences. So I'm just going to switch to that. Um, Um, so reading from the second paragraph here, I suggest that it is the task of the logic of scientific discovery or the logic of knowledge. Why is this? Or the logic of knowledge. Um, to give a logical analysis of this procedure, that is, to analyze the method of the empirical sciences. So question number one of the book is, um, what is the method of the empirical sciences? So it's a question of what Popper calls methodology. But then, Underneath that is this other sh very short paragraph, but what are these methods of the empirical sciences and what do we call empirical science? So the other question of the book besides the methodological question, what are the methods of empirical science? Which we'll see basically means what should be the methods of empirical science. Um, the other main question is what Popper calls the demarcation problem. Um, what are the empirical sciences? That is, it's called the demarcation problem because the idea is to draw a line between empirical sciences and everything else that isn't empirical science. I guess everything else, every other kind of what discourse research like activity i'm not sure but anyway everything that's kind of like empirical science but isn't empirical science um so um and that actually so i'm going to write these two things up here Methodology and and the answer to give away the punchline at the beginning to the demarcation problem 
is Popper's most famous view that um, what demarcates empirical scientific theories from everything else is their falsifiability. Um, so, I mean, uh, I'm going to talk about that in detail later, but I just want to point out a couple things about it right away. Number one, this I know is important be just because I know that students have often gotten confused by this in the past. Falsifiability is not the same as falsification. Um, that is, um, a scientific theory is a theory that's falsifiable, not a theory that has actually been falsified. Um, of course, if there is a true scientific theory, and Popper's view, uh, ultimately, it's a little unclear at this stage, but anyway, Popper's uh, settled view, I think, is that there's, there's no reason there couldn't be a true scientific theory, although if we had one, we wouldn't know for sure that we had one. <laughs> um, or actually, we, not, even, not just know for sure, we wouldn't know anything that made it probable it was true. <laughs> But um, but there could be a true scientific theory, and obviously a true scientific theory could not be falsified, right? Because all the evidence you took in would agree with it, so it would never be falsified. So falsifiability just means that um, um, the theory is such that if the evidence came in a certain way, it would count as falsified. Um, and that's supposed to be the distinction between scientific theories and other things, like what other things? Well, um, one other thing is logic, or also Popper agrees with the um, Vienna Circle people that mathematics is part of logic. Right, so logic and mathematics, they're not falsifiable. They don't make empirical predictions that could be wrong. Popper, again, agrees with the uh, Vienna Circle people that the reason they don't is because they're tautological. That is, they say things that are true just by virtue of the meaning of the terms and the structure of the sentence. So they don't claim anything extra about what observations might be made. Um, so um, that's something that's distinguished from empirical science by this criterion. That shows right away, incidentally, and this is important, that um, Popper does not think that everything that's outside of this demarcation line is bad. He doesn't think sci that logic and mathematics are bad. He just thinks they're not empirical science, um, which is a reasonable view, although not a universal view, right? Like, I mean, Mill famously argued that logic and mathematics are empirical sciences, and there's people, you know, have been other people who thought, and, and are other people who think that, but it's a pr pretty reasonable view. Um, so, um, what else gets left out? Well, so something that's not left out, and this will be important when we go to Kuhn, is engineering, right? As far as Popper is concerned, science and technology and engineering are all basically one enterprise. Um, so that's not left out by this, it's not supposed to be left out by this criterion, and it apparently is not left out, right? Like engineers, also say things about the world that, that could be wrong. <laughs> this bridge will not collapse or whatever. Um, so um, what else gets left out outside? 
Well, um, I mean, presumably stuff like poetry and fiction and whatever. I'm not even sure whether or not that's part of the universe he's trying to divide up here. But uh, more relevantly is something that's supposed to be left out is metaphysics. However, and I'll talk about this more later, that doesn't... He agrees with the Vienna Circle and with the metaphysicians themselves, whoever it is they're thinking about here as the metaphysicians. I think it's mostly, it's really Husserl that they're thinking of, but uh, they don't usually say that. But in any case, whoever it is they're thinking about, they're thinking about metaphysicians who also agree with this. We're not doing empirical science. So again, like it's not supposed to be controversial that metaphysics is outside of this demarcation line. But moreover, unlike the Vienna Circle, Popper goes out of his way to say, and by the way, I don't think metaphysics is such as bad, I just think it's not empirical science. And by the way, I don't think it's meaningless either. It's meaningful, it's just not empirical science. Okay, so, so far, everything that's outside the line is just not empirical science, and it's not bad, which might make you wonder, well, why is it so important to draw this line, then? But there is something that's outside the line that Popper thinks is bad, and that is pseudoscience. Right, and roughly speaking, pseudoscience is something that um, looks like empirical science, but isn't really. That's what Popper is really worried about. Right, I mean, he, it's, he wants all those other things I mentioned to fall on the other side of the line because it seems to him that they should. They're not empirical science. But the reason it's so important to him to draw the line is that he wants to make clear the distinction between empirical science and things that look like empirical science, but they're really not. And that's what he calls pseudoscience. Um, and the most important examples of pseudoscience from Popper's point of view, or at least the ones that he most often is thinking of, are number one, I already mentioned, um, 20th century Marxism, later Marxism, and number two, Freudian psychoanalysis. These are things that the Vienna Circle were not hostile to, right? As I mentioned already a lot of times, Neurot was himself a Marxist, and um, although, you know, Carnap was not, he, he wasn't in the business of trying to rule out Marxism as meaningless or whatever. Um, and Freudian psychoanalysis, I haven't mentioned that, but the um, uh, logical positivists were relatively friendly to that. There's even a stage in the Aufbau that we didn't read this part where Carnap constructs the unconscious basic experiences <laughs> on the basis of the conscious ones. Okay, so that's the overall project here. Now, in the text, um, this, I mean, this isn't entirely true, but basically, this is chapter one. And this is chapter two. Now, I mean, when I say this is chapter one, I mean, in a sense, this, this is almost the whole book. A lot of the book is details of what falsifiability means and what observations are and whatever. But chapter one basically, like, introduces that whole um, uh, framework of issues about introduces falsifiability and the whole framework of issues surrounding it. Um, whereas chapter two it basically introduces the issue of methodology. Um, um,
but um, I feel like that's actually a little bit of a misleading order to put it in. Um, um, I think, you know, this, you know, so one thing I said was, well, the, the translation history gave rise to some of these myths, or at least allowed them to continue that, that Popper complained about. But a lot of them started early, you know, while they were all still writing in German and still in Germany and Austria. Um, so, um, well, even that, it may be because they read some of his early papers and not the book. But in any case, I think part of the genesis of some of those myths um, and also something that gave rise to the one of the myths is that there was some obvious objection to this theory to this view of, of falsifiability as the criterion which then Popper tried to patch up you know when he was caught having made an obvious error um, and I think that's not true, but that this organization of talking about this first and then there's probably helped to give rise to that. Um, and in particular, so here's the obvious objection. Um, it's related to what we saw Putnam saying and we'll see Putnam saying it about Popper later. Um, scientific theories can't really be falsified by observations because, um, um, well, it's related to what we saw Putnam say, say, sorry, it's related to what we saw Quine saying, really, more than what we saw Putnam saying. But in any case, right, the scientific theories can't be really be falsified by any observations because every observation can always be accommodated by changing other you know, um, theoretical statements or by changing some background information that we were relying on to derive the observational predictions. So, um, right, so again, the example of Halley's Comet, I mean, I gave a very dramatic way of, but you know, if Halley's Comet didn't come back when it was supposed to, you could say, well, you know, there's a massive planet in the outer solar system that we didn't know about, and it, you know, and its orbit was perturbed by that, and, you know, that could be enough to eject it from the solar system, and it will never come back, right? Um, so the the falsifying observation. Theory of universal gravitation predicts that Halley's Comet will be seen in such and such a place at such and such a time can be explained away by saying, and the falsifying observation is it's not there. <laughs> the falsifying observation can be explained away by adjusting other stuff so that the theory remains unrefuted. So that's supposed to be the obvious objection that this criterion of falsifiability um, doesn't yield anything as empirical science um, because no scientific theory, no theory at all, in fact, is falsifiable. Um, um, and the reason it's um, not true that this was an obvious objection that Popper never thought of is because Popper himself mentions this fact about scientific theories um, and he mentions it actually already in chapter one, although only as a preview to what he's going to talk about later. Why is that kind of... A third objection may seem more serious. I don't know why this is kind of washed out, but... A third objection may seem more serious. It might be said that even if the asymmetry is admitted, it is still impossible for various reasons that any theoretical system should ever be conclusively falsified. For it is always possible to find some way of evading falsification. For example, now the examples I gave, although I don't think this is true, you might kind of say, well, maybe sometimes it will be impossible to do that. 
right, it'll be impossible to think of a way of changing my background assumptions or whatever to account for these observations. But Popper says, um, for example, by introducing an auxiliary hypothesis, that's what I, was, I mentioned, or by changing ad hoc a definition, or it is even possible without logical inconsistency to adopt the position of simply refusing to acknowledge any falsifying experience whatsoever. <laughs> right? Popper says, um, I can always say, no, I don't trust that observation. Any theory can be defended that way. So actually, Popper, um, you know, believes a very strong version of this, so, so to speak, objection. He already knows about it in 1934, and um, um, uh, it can't be news to him if Neurath or Putnam or anyone else mentions it later. Um, he says the same thing again in chapter two um, on page 28. I won't, well, maybe I should, why not? Show it to you inside the book. This. Um. Light somehow. That's kind of a thing. Maybe if I. Um. In point of fact. No conclusive disproof of a theory can ever be produced, for it is always possible to say that the experimental results are not reliable, or that the discrepancies which are asserted to exist between the experimental results and the theory are only apparent, and that they will disappear with the advance of our understanding. So that's another um, uh, like universal way of getting out of inconvenient observations that he mentions you could do besides just refusing to accept the refuting observations you can you can say well i can't think of another auxiliary hypothesis or background assumption or whatever that will explain this observation but you know i think there probably is one or anyway we don't know there isn't so we shouldn't abandon the theory Um, so, so if Popper knows about this objection way back when, what's his answer to it? The answer is um, that um, falsifiability by itself doesn't ensure that what you're doing is empirical science. A falsifiable theory is um, a theory that's suitable to be used in empirical science, but you only are using an empirical science if you follow the correct method. Right? So, in fact, the methodology part comes first. The method of empirical science is, um, is a method of subjecting theories to severe tests. Um, that's basically the answer to the methodology question. And the, the answer to the demarcation question follows from that. Because what we want to do is subject our theories to severe tests and give them up in the face of bad tests, we need to start with theories that in principle can be falsified by observations. That is universal theories that, that, that imply some singular observable facts. But um, of course, if we don't adopt that correct methodology and instead adopt some other methodology, for example, of defending our favorite theory no matter what, 
then the fact that the theory is falsifiable won't help because we're not trying to falsify it, we're trying to defend it. Okay, so, and um, you can see that the way I just put it now, it doesn't sound like an ad hoc fix to an objection that someone came up with, right? That is, if you answer the methodology question first, then from that point of view, you can understand why the demarcation criterion should be what it is, even though it's true that you could always refuse to let your theory be falsified. Because the first thing we said is, empirical science is holding theories, but being willing to let them be falsified. Right. Um, then the second thing we said is, and for that purpose, you better use a falsifiable theory. But at this point, the objection, you could always defend the theory no matter what, is obviously not a good objection because we started off saying we're not going to do that. That's the methodology. We don't want to defend a theory no matter what. And that's why we want theories that present us with the occasions for giving them up, basically. Um, in fact, uh, those two kinds of, those two examples of pseudoscience that I mentioned, I think Popper um, um, thinks that they're pseudoscience in two different ways. The example of Freudian psychology is supposed to be an example of a theory that's in principle not falsifiable that is set up in such a way as to be able to explain any observation. Basically, whatever the patient tells you, no matter how inconsistent it seems to be with your theory of how the mind works, you can always explain that as resistance or something like that, right? So that's his objection to this, to, to Freudian psychology. Whereas 20th century Marxism, his objection is going to be that although they, although Marx's original economic slash political theory was highly falsifiable, um, it predicted all kinds of things that um, basically when those things started to not happen, <laughs> um, uh, you know, the capitalist uh, political and economic system didn't evolve the way Marx said it would, that rather than saying, oh, the theory is falsified, the approach that was taken was to say, well, but we can still defend it by adjusting other, other stuff, by changing definitions ad hoc, by adopting auxiliary hypotheses, oh, there's this thing called imperialism, that blah, 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 that, you know, um, um, probably not so much those universal methods of just saying, well, that didn't happen. <laughs> um, at least, well, I guess at some point that was that, that, method was also adopted. <laughs> um, but in any case, that's not mostly what he's worried about. Um, okay. Um, so that's the general introduction to the book. Um, are there questions about that? Then no introduction to the book and to today's reading, which kind of summarizes what's important in the book. Um, so now, so I'm actually going to go on and say a little bit more about the methodology issue and try to get back that way to the demarcation problem. So the methodology issue is... Um, it's about the logic of something. It, the something that he in German he called Forschung, which means usually is translated as research. Although I think it's like also can be translated sometimes as exploration. Um, it's like the search part of research is more. Um, uh, explicit in the German word than in the English word. It's like looking for something. Um, 
I think that's what, when you translate it into English as logical, as a scientific discovery, he was thinking of the meaning of the English word discovery, meaning like exploring in order to discover stuff. Um, so, but it's basically, as you can see from those sentences that I wrote, uh, that I read at the beginning, it's basically the logic of empirical science. And what is the logic of empirical science? Well, Popper says logic is rules for, logic in general means rules for thinking, for, you know, talking, evaluating sentences, um, stuff like that. And um, like general logic, formal logic is the rules for doing that with statements in general, and it's based on tautologies. But the logic of X means the rules of the game of X, as he puts it. So these are like the rules of the game of empirical science. Um, and what is empirical science? Well, I mean, so the the official answer to that is the demarcation problem. But before you get to that, in a sense, you have to realize something that he thinks about what science is. And that's a disagreement between him and Quine and Carnap. And this is, shouldn't be a surprise because I've been emphasizing this all along. That Carnap and Quine and those people basically think of science as a system of concepts or terms. Right, and um, uh, so empirical science is has its special status, um, has been so successful, uh, is worthy of emulation, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, because it adopts the right kind of concepts, legitimate empirical concepts. So a scientific theory is basically a system of concepts, although of course, you know, then you also have to supply axioms to get predictions out of it. But the concepts are what really makes it scientific. Um, a metaphysical theory could have axioms and could be just as rigorous in that sense, but it, the whole thing would be meaningless because the concepts were not legitimate. Whereas uh, Popper says early on, um, this is at the bottom of page 11, Science is not a system of concepts, but rather a system of statements. Right? Statements translates the German word Satz, sometimes to be translated as sentence, sometimes as proposition. Um, but, you know, a statement uses concepts to say something. Right? So, like, if... Um, white and swan are concepts, then a state, an example of a statement is all swans are white. That's a um, universal statement, so it could be thought of as a, perhaps as a law of nature or a natural law. Um, um, it probably shouldn't be thought of as a natural law, but I think uh, um, Popper thinks of it as an example of, I mean, as an example of a candidate natural law. Of course, it's definitely not a actual natural law because it's not true. Right? I mean, it's already been falsified. There's plenty of swans that are black. So, um, but um, um, so we're thinking of a scientific theory as a bunch of statements like this that are true or false. And we want to provide a um, demarcation that will separate out systems of statements that are empirical scientific theories from others that are not. 
Um, so, um, Popper, um, sorry, that's the demarcation question. So the methodological question is, how should empirical scientists in the process of accepting or rejecting statements, how should they proceed? Um, and this has already taken me longer than I hoped to get through this part. Yeah, okay, it's not too bad. So, um, Popper has an answer to that question, and I basically already told you what the answer is. The answer is, the way they should proceed is um, get some statements from somewhere, um, adopt some of them, and then start testing them. And, uh, you know, I mean, not just one by one, like he agrees that, you know, what we're really talking about here is whole theories. We want the theory to output certain observational statements or basic statements, as he puts them. Um, we want the theory to, to uh, output certain from the universal law of the laws of the theory, we want to be able to get some individual predictions, and um, um, and we want to try to show that some of them are wrong. And once after a while, the theory has become accepted um, because it's passed a lot of these tests. We want to keep testing that theory, but we also are interested in finding other theories that compete with it, that would in some ways be an improvement on it, and testing those to see if they're not better. Or when I say to see if they're not better, I mean, they would be better if they were true in some sense. Um, they say more about the world or something like that. Um, so we, we would like to adopt these theories instead, but what we do is we say, okay, let's find a place where the new theory disagrees with the old theory and see which one is right. So we, we, again, we, we subject both of them to a test. That's the method. Um, And Popper says, so that's the answer to the question, like the, the methodological question is, what is the logic of empirical science? And the methodological answer is, the method of empirical science is severe testing of theories. Um, what kind of statement is that? Right, that is the one I just said. The method of empirical science is severe testing of theories. Um, so um, Popper says that statement I just made is a stipulation or proposal of a convention. When I say that, what I mean is Let's call empirical science the activity that adopts this method. I'm proposing it to you as a possible thing that should be called empirical science. So in a way, this is very similar to Carnap. Why? Because he's saying that on the one hand, this statement itself is not a statement of empirical science. Um, statements of empirical science are not proposals of what to call things. They're predictions that can be false, or they're, they're universal rules that make predictions that could go wrong. A, a proposed convention doesn't make predictions that could go wrong. I'm not predicting that this is what you will call empirical science. I'm, I'm proposing it. 
stipulating it for myself, promising to call that empirical science, so to speak, and proposing it to you to accept it. So it's not an empirical statement, nor is it a tautological, tautological or purely logically true statement, right? It's not a contradiction to say that something else is empirical science. How can something be neither a purely logical or analytic statement, nor an empirical or synthetic a priori statement? Well, um, one way would be if it's synthetic a priori in Kant's terminology. That is, it's something that the opposite of which is not self-contradictory. So we don't know it just, just based on logic. So maybe I should write these down. Is it analytic? Is it synthetic? A posteriori? That is empirical? This is Kant's terminology. If you're not familiar with it, don't worry about it too much. But analytic means it's logically true. The opposite of it would be a contradiction. Um, synthetic a posteriori means it's empirical. What else could it be? And Kant has another category here. It could be synthetic a priori, which means that it's we don't know it just by logic, but it also isn't empirical. It says it's not empirical, it's not falsifiable. So it's something we know for sure, not based on experience. Um, Popper agrees with Carnap and the logical positivists. In a sense, this is what logical positivist or logical empiricist means. It means that there's only these two. There is no synthetic a priori. Popper agrees. He doesn't say why, but he says Kant tried this method of synthetic a priori and it didn't work out. By the way, it's worth noticing that we're back in Germany, right? That is the history of uh, modern philosophy uh, doesn't go from Hume to Bentham and Alexander Bryan Johnson to Frege, who's an honorary English-speaking philosopher, to Russell, <laughs> right, who's been Frege has been naturalized. Frege, it doesn't it doesn't go through England and America. The history of philosophy goes through Kant again, and at some point in this reading. Uh, uh, in a footnote, uh, I didn't write down what page this is on, but um, Popper actually says, from Hume via Kant to Russell and Whitehead, right? That's, you know. So anyway, so, um, but, but Hume says, I mean, Hume, Popper says, this was a reasonable try, but it didn't work out. So we don't have synthetic a priori. So what else is there? And Popper agrees with Carnap. What else is there is, is things that are not theoretical statements about what's true and false, but are practical proposals of what we should do. However, unlike Carnap, Popper thinks that um, there is a theory or science, even he calls it sometimes, though it's not empirical science, of methodology. That is, there's something systematic to be said on this topic. Um, and that's why he has a whole book that's basically about that. And this means, as Popper points out, that he disagrees with Carnap about something else. Um, right, so I'll write here. Actually, maybe I should erase this. Right, the question is, what is methodology? In German, the term is Methodenlehre. It's actually a Kantian term. It's actually the, the name of the second part of the first critique is Methodenlehre. Kant's about how 
can tell in this video. I don't know. Anyway, so um, what is methodology? Not analytic. It's not empirical. It's not synthetic a priori. Rather, it's practical. The logic of X is basically where is basically a branch of ethics or politics. It's a proposal of what to do when you when you are trying to do X. <laughs> it's rules of the game of X. Um, but again, because it's a practical um, science, it's something that you can argue about rationally, that you can say systematic things about, this follows from this, etc. It means that unlike Carnap, Popper thinks that there's perfectly, Popper has to say, because he has to say this about his own book, that there's a perfectly meaningful, reasonable area that you can um, talk about that, uh, that has content to it, it's not tautological, and that is not empirical science. Right, so I emphasized this at the beginning and now I emphasize it again. The demarcation criterion and the answer to the methodological criterion are not supposed to make a distinction between what's meaningful and what's meaningless, what's bad and what's good. It can't be because Popper himself says that what he's doing in this book is outside the, the, the demarcation criterion. And he says, unlike Wittgenstein and the Tractatus, I'm not going to tell you at the end, throw away the latter, right? That what I said was really nonsense. No, I think what I'm saying is perfectly meaningful, but it's not empirical science. So, and this is why he rejects what he, like Quine, calls naturalism, right? He says, philosophy is not just a branch of the empirical sciences, right? There's at least, there's an important thing which you can call philosophy, that is methodology, which is not a branch of empirical science. It's not to be studied by empirical psychology, for example, or sociology. It's not a description of what scientists actually do. They might all not do it. We might find by empirical study, it would still be his proposal that they should do it. Now that's, I mean, it's a little bit tricky. It's not quite as cut and dried as it seemed because as I said at the beginning of the course and as Popper himself acknowledges, including in this reading, you know, the problem of coming up with a methodology of empirical science, of deciding what we should call empirical science and whatever, is like it only presents itself to philosophy because empirical science seems to be a thing and a very successful rational thing, right? So in real life, if it turned out that we studied all the scientists and we found that they're not only are they not doing this, but they're not doing anything that looks reasonable, Although it wouldn't be a refutation of Popper's methodology, it would deprive it of its motivation. So it's not like Popper is completely immune from an attack on the basis of psychology, empirical psychology or sociology. And that's gonna be an important loophole because that's basically exactly how Kuhn is going to get in and criticize him. But, um, but what is the case is it can't, there isn't a simple way of, first of all, there isn't, you can't say 
hey, Popper, your own stuff's not falsifiable, so you're no good, right? He says to begin with, yeah, my own stuff is not falsifiable, and that's why what I'm doing is not empirical science. It's something else. It has its own logic. It has its own rules of how to do it reasonably, um, which he hints at here and there um, in this reading, but which he only wrote about more at length much later. So, I mean, um, but it's, you know, it's logic or methodology is not the logic or methodology of empirical science. Um, oh, someone asked, I don't know if this was just now or a long time ago, what was analytic again? Right, so again, analytic, this is Kant's term, an analytic statement is a statement that's true just by virtue of the meaning um, of the concepts or terms involved. So an example of an analytic statement would be um, Right? All swans are either white, white or not white. This is true. It's not, it's not true by virtue of the meaning of swans and white. It's true by, meaning of the, by virtue of the meaning of the logical vocabulary. Um, there's more controversy when you get to statements that are supposed to be true because of the meaning of the individual terms in them. But this, I mean, this actually is more the type of example that Carnap and Popper are usually thinking of. All swans are white, white or not white. It's not falsifiable. And it seems reasonable to say, yeah, it's not falsifiable because it doesn't say anything in particular about the world. It says something that if you understand the language you know already is true and you don't have to check. Right. Um, and I think, you know, as I mentioned briefly, Quine, other Quine, not the paper we read, but Quine's other most famous paper um, attacking logical positivism, the two dogmas of empiricism, is an attack on the analytic synthetic distinction saying that we can't really say which sentences are analytic and which are not. But, um, but Popper is on Carnap's side on this, as in many other things. He, you know, he takes it for granted in this book that you can make that distinction. Okay. All right, so I'm done talking about methodology, and now I'm going to talk about the demarcation problem. I mean, when I say I'm done talking about it, of course it's going to come up. That's the whole reason I thought I, I think it should go first, because it's the actual motivation for what happens when we talk about the demarcation problem. Um, So, so the demarcation problem, which Popper also sometimes calls Kant's problem, is somehow related to another problem. The problem of induction, which Popper, following Kant, sometimes calls Hume's problem, at least following his interpretation of Kant. I'm not sure that Kant would actually agree that what Popper calls the problem of induction is really Hume's problem. But in any case, this is um, not a course about Kant and Hume. It's a course about Popper. And, um, 
and Popper's interpretation of Kant and Hume, although um, it might not be the most careful, it's actually, I think, is interesting. Um, uh, you know, it might, might not be the most careful or the most detailed, although he does quote Kant in you know all kinds of obscure places in the first critique, for example, he's definitely read it. Um, but um, um, but yeah, it's interesting and is important to him. It's not just uh, window dressing. He sees himself as does Carnap, I think. But um, as I argue that Carnap also sees himself this way. But I think for Popper, this has more content. He sees himself as in some way continuing Kant's project. Okay, so anyway, um, there's Kant's problem and Hume's problem, or the demarcation problem and the problem of induction. So the reason these two get related to each other is because Popper says a popular answer to the demarcation problem is that empirical science is uh, an empirical scientific theory is a theory that can be supported by induction. We can show that it's true or at least show that it's probable using induction. And what is induction? Induction is when you start with singular statements and you get to universal statements. Right, so the idea is, you know, uh, what is a scientific theory? A scientific theory is the kind of theory where um, the reason we believe it's true is because we collected a lot of evidence that supports it. Um, So this, I mean, is definitely a popular uh, then, now as then, a popular idea of what scientists are, empirical scientists are doing. Um, um, and uh, I mean, it's, it's just like Popper's alternative. It has a methodological part and that is really what yields the demarcation problem part, right? I mean, I think I almost, I kind of slipped between the two of them even when I was now describing, right? But so the idea is the demarcation, answer to the demarcation problem is gonna be a scientific theory is a theory that can, logically speaking, be supported by evidence, right? And when you put it that way, that is basically Carnap's answer early and late. A theory that could be supported or falsified, but you know, but they concentrate more on the supported. It could be supported by evidence. So, um, um, and you know, what's behind that is a methodological proposal that the way scientists should work is that they should examine the evidence and see which theory it supports. So the pr the the thing that Popper points out, however, the thing that Popper points out is very obvious in a sense, um, um, which should always make you suspicious. It's not as if Carnap doesn't know this. It's not as if Popper doesn't know Carnap knows this, but um, but in any case, the thing he points out is that singular, no number of singular statements will ever imply, logically speaking, a universal statement. Um, um, 
you might think there's an exception to this if you deal with a statement like all the pens on this desk are black. Um, if you understand that to mean for all x, if x is a pen on this desk, x is black, that looks like a universal statement, and yet it can be implied, it can be, it's implied by the statement, this pen on the desk is black, this pen on the desk is black, this pen is the, and once you've checked every pen on the desk, it has to be true, right? Um, uh, well, I guess that is, it's implied by those plus the remaining statement, but which is also a singular statement. There are only five pens on this desk or whatever. Um, so, uh, um, um, on, you know, is that a counterexample? Well, on one way of understanding it, it's not. If we take all pens on this desk are black to be a proposed law of nature, meaning that if I bring a blue pen and put it on this desk, it will turn black then uh, um, then no, it's not implied by those singular statements. And moreover, there's something wrong with it. <laughs> right? I mean, uh, that predicate is not projectable, as Goodman would say. We don't form laws of nature using pr predicates like all the pens on this desk. Right? If it's not understood that way, then we have to say, basically, and we'll see, I mean, Popper will address this later, but whether he can satisfactorily or not is another question. But we have to say, well, you know, although you can write that using formal logic to look like a universal statement, you can, you can tell that it's not really a universal statement. It's actually just a, a conjunction of a bunch of singular statements, and that's why it can be implied. Okay, I probably spent more time on that than I should have, but are there questions about that? In general, it's, you know, it's, it's not the case that any, that, that a statement like for all x, px is a logical consequence of a, theory, of a statement like pa, right? This is never a valid sentence. Um, and even if you add any number of these, um, even if you add infinitely many, depending on, perhaps, depending on how you think about what x ranges over, but certainly if even you add any finite number of them, it will never be a valid sentence. So, Popper says, um, uh, what is an empirical scientific theory then according to this proposed criterion? There are no theories like that. There are no theories that can be universal theories that can be supported by individual pieces of evidence. So, um, what you might think is, well, um, you just need to supply another principle that you've left out, the principle of induction that tells you, so true, sure enough, the laws of logic as, un, as ordinarily understood don't make any sentence like that valid. But there's a principle of induction that we all know uh, that uh, um, that if you get enough support for a theory, you should accept it, and it's not one of the laws of logic, but it's all but it's a principle we should accept. So Popper says, "Well, okay, what kind of principle is that?" So then we get those same alternatives. Is it analytic? Well, we've basically already admitted that it's not, right? I mean, as or as Pavar puts it, we only have this problem because we've already admitted that it's not that induction is not logically valid. 
no matter how many swans I find are black are, are white, it will never be a contradiction to say not all swans are white. Right? So is it, okay, maybe it's an empirical principle. So people do sometimes try saying that, right? Why should we adopt induction? Well, because it's, it's been so successful. All our experience of it is of it leading us to make correct predictions and accept true theories. But as Popper points out, without some kind of further attention, there seems, at least, there seems to be a big problem with that, namely that it's circular. Or, I guess to put it differently, it leads to a universal, it leads to an infinite regress. I mean, you can look at it either way. Popper looks at it the infinite regress way, namely that you need another principle to explain how, why you would, why you accepted the empirical evidence for your principle of induction. And then you need another principle to, to support that principle and another principle and so on and so forth. Could it be synthetic a priori? Well, Popper says, and again, I'm not sure about this as an interpretation of Kant, but Popper says, yes, that's what Kant tried to solve Hume's problem, to say that the principle of induction is synthetic a priori. But again, he agrees with the positivists. Well, he doesn't say exactly why, that, that that project didn't work out. So, um, I mean, the positivists do say why, right? They say, like, a purported synthetic a priori statement would be meaningless. <laughs> but uh, Popper can't say that. He just says that, that Kant tried very ingeniously to do this, but it didn't work. So what does that leave us with? Well, again, it leaves us with the idea that this is a practical proposal. And that's what Popper says. Right? So... So the issue about Hume's problem, although on the face of it, it looks like, and Popper sometimes talks this way, he's saying Hume's problem just can't be solved, and that's why we shouldn't be inductivists. What he really means is um, Hume's problem can't be solved theoretically. It's really not a theoretical problem. It's really a practical problem. When you say empirical science works inductively, and empirical scientific theories are theories that we accept on the basis of observational evidence. What you mean is empirical science should work this way and we should adopt theories for that reason. Um, So why is he in get against inductivism, as he often calls it? Why is he against it? Um, well, he must be against it for practical reasons. That is, he must think it's a bad proposal for how we should do science. Um, Now, I mean, it's actually bad for a couple of reasons, I think. One reason has to do with naturalism or with temptations to naturalism. Um, Popper thinks that although it's evident that this principle of induction couldn't really be a theoretical statement, it couldn't be something that you're putting forward as it should be accepted because it's true. Um, because we've ruled out all the alternatives for that. Um, nevertheless, people tend to state it as if it were something like that. So they'll say, you know, here's this principle of induction. We know it's true. And he says it's always dangerous when that happens. I think, again, here he's in agreement with Carnap, although maybe not for exactly the same reason. When something that's really a practic is really a practical question gets treated as if it were a theoretical question, um, that's dangerous. And Popper says the reason it's dangerous is because it leads to dogmatism. That is, 
it leads you to accept as if it were empirical an empirical truth about the world, something that nevertheless, because it's really a practical proposal, you're not prepared to accept any falsification of. And he quotes Wittgenstein in the Tractatus, again, that is early Wittgenstein, to show that that is really the conclusion that the positivists reached, or that some of them reached, that this uh, principle of induction is unassailable. You can't challenge it. So he says, well, that's a bad thing. Um, but, uh, but I think never, I mean, first of all, as a criticism of Carnap, I don't think even Carnap of the Aufbau, let alone the somewhat later Carnap that Popper mentions in a footnote, um, I don't think that would be a fair criticism of him. Um, he really is already a naturalist. That's what I claimed when I was talking about Quine last time. Um, so Popper is right to stick him with that. But he really, I think, already understands in the Aufbau that what he's saying here, that, that the um, thesis that this is what meaning is, uh, is itself a practical thesis and not a theoretical one. Um, um, so if, uh, if that wouldn't be a fair criticism of Carnap, does that mean that Popper doesn't have a criticism of him? No, because he has a criticism of this as a practical thesis. Namely, he thinks it's a bad idea. This isn't how you should do science. Um, In roughly thinking, speaking, I think he'll say more about this later, but roughly speaking, I think the reason for it is this. Um, what he understands as the methodological principle behind adopting induction as the criterion of demarcation is... Um, this is Popper's proposal, falsifiability versus induction. That's the proposal he's opposing. So he's saying that this derives from a methodological position that are called justification rules. And the methodological proposal of justificationism is that um, our aim in empirical science should be to justify, or that is like defend what we think is the true theory. And so what we should be doing is looking for evidence that would, so to speak, force people to adopt our theory. Now, of course, not literally force them, right? But force them insofar as they're rational. So we're looking for evidence that would get a rational person to, ex to agree with us that, that the theory we think is true is, is actually true. So the evidence, of course, that we're going to have to use for that will ultimately be singular statements. Right? I mean, ultimately, at least, because, you know, um, if they don't agree with us about one universal statement, and we try to support it with another one, they're going to say, well, I don't agree with that one either. So, like, in the end, you have to have something you can show them. Look at this. This is why you should think my theory is true. And that's why this methodological position results in this answer to the demarcation problem, that what empirical science is, is inductive science. So Popper thinks that 
defending a theory you think is true against all attacks is a bad way to conduct, he thinks it's a bad way to conduct yourself in general. Although he himself perhaps was um, a good example of someone who did conduct himself that way. It's, it's a kind of paradox, about, a kind of personality slash ethical paradox about Popper. But in any case, he thinks this is not a good way to conduct yourself in general, and in empirical science, it's not a good way to conduct yourself empirically, so to speak. Um, rather, what, you sh what should you be doing? Um, you should take a theory under your consideration and you should try to falsify it. You should, or more broadly speaking, criticize it. You should adopt your, you should subject your own views to severe criticism, the severest criticism you can think of. That's the right way to go. We call this falsificationism, sometimes he calls it, or, you know, you could call it critical philosophy. That's Kant's term for what he's doing. I guess you could also call it critical theory. <laughs> um, looking ahead to our uh, colloquium speaker right after coming up right after this class. <laughs> um, uh, although uh, it's uh, Popper's politics are not those we usually associate with what's called critical theory now. <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah, so you should subject your own views to the most severe test you can. And so why is this a good idea and this a bad idea? Well, I think, I mean, um, Popper actually has a lot to say about this in this book and in other books, but I think you can already see why someone, and also how this might fit together with a certain political position in particular, but why someone might think that ethically slash politically, this is the wrong posture to be in. Trying to hold on to your own beliefs and defend them against all comers. This is the right position to be in. Accepting beliefs for now, provisionally, but trying your best to criticize them. So that, I think, um, uh, really is an important difference between Popper and Carnap. And moreover, the difference I keep emphasizing about concepts versus statements is related to it. Um, because um, there's two ways to see this. Um, one way to see it would be just uh, to say, well, uh, statements can be falsified, concepts can't be falsified. Now, I actually think personally that um, Popper, that, that that's not right exactly, that concepts, I mean, concepts can't be true or false, right? It's like swan. Is it true or false? They can't be true or false, but they can be good or bad, and empirical evidence can show that a concept is bad. Um, but, uh, so, I mean, that's what I would argue, but that's not, for the most part, what the people in this debate think, um, any of them. So they're just thinking, look, you know, the concept swan, it could be false that all swans are white. It could be false that there are any swans at all, but the concept can't be false. It doesn't assert anything. So concepts can't be falsified. Whereas statements, some of them can be falsified. Right, so that already is one reason of saying that I think I pointed the wrong way, maybe, but that that already is one reason of seeing why Popper would want to say a scientific theory consists of statements, whereas um, uh, Carnap would be happy with saying, or perhaps even want would want to say, a scientific theory consists of concepts. Another way to see it, which is in a sense just, uh, I mean. 
maybe in a sense just another way of putting the same thing, but in some complicated sense. So like, This theory, at least if we accept that this is a universal theory, how could it not be? Well, you might think this is like something like all pens on this desk are black, basically. That's how it might turn out not to be a, really a universal theory. But in any case, treat this as a universal theory, a proposed natural law, all swans are white. It's falsifiable. It can be falsified by a black swan. This statement is not falsifiable, it's tautological. But they use exactly the same concepts. Right? So if you're trying to draw a line around empirical science by saying empirical science uses legitimate concepts, um, then... Um, that line couldn't go between these two statements. Right? If swan and white are legitimate empirical concepts, then um, this statement would be just as good as that one. And if they're not, this statement would be just as bad as that one. So, um, so this, again, as I said, is another way of seeing why for Popper to make falsifiability, the criterion of demarcation, um, um, he has to concentrate on statements rather than concepts. Whereas, and this I guess is what I'm going to end with, um, if you're concentrating on whether singular statements support your universal statement, then if singular statements support this one, they definitely support that one. In the, of course, not in the sense of raising its probability or something, because it's already certainly true, but in the sense of implying it logically. Right? The problem of induction doesn't affect this one. Singular statements do imply it, only because everything implies it, because it's logically valid. <laughs> right? Um, so, so actually, that's, that's a qualification on what I said before that I should have included, but you can probably fill it in. But so in any case, so for uh, the inductionist demarcation criterion, um, 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 we don't get it. I'm getting confused. I'm just worrying what I, I just feel like I started to say something that's that doesn't make sense. Let me get back to this next time if if necessary. But the first part I said is definitely true. If falsification is supposed to be the demarcation criterion, it couldn't go between this and this. Okay, and on that note, I will uh see you on uh next week. Okay. Bye.